Well, I, I hope that you enjoy every time you come to church and every time we get to read scripture. I really think you're going to enjoy this one tonight because um, it could it could be taken it could be taken um, if taken to heart it could it could make you feel bad or it could make you feel good and I'm I'm leaning on the feel good. Uh, with tonight's message. So if you would turn with me to Psalm 64. Psalm number 64. And David, David writes, Hear my voice, O God, in my meditation. Preserve my life from fear of the enemy. Hide me from the secret plots of the wicked. From the rebellion of the workers of iniquity, who sharpen their tongue like a sword and bend their bows to shoot their arrows, bitter words, that they may shoot in secret at the blameless. And suddenly they shoot at him and do not fear. They encourage themselves in an evil matter. They talk of lying snares, secret or laying snares secretly. They say, who will see them? They devise iniquities. We have perfected a shrewd scheme. Both the inward thought and the heart of a man are deep. But God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly they shall be wounded. So he will make them stumble over their own tongue. All who see them shall flee away. All men shall fear and shall declare the work of God, for they shall wisely consider his doing. The righteous shall be glad in the Lord and trust in him, and all the upright in heart shall glory. There's three, four really, um, Four main points to draw from this psalm tonight. The first would be, not really, not really in any order, but the first would be that we shall not fear. That what David begins his prayer, begins his prayer with a with a, a call to God, not a command, but a call. Hear my voice. It's kind of like a child who feels like he's not being heard. And what, is, what does that type of child usually do? He raises his voice, raises his voice, usually until he either screams or he takes a temper tantrum or, you know. But a lot of times, if you just stop and you give that child just a moment of attention, just a moment so that their voice can be heard, it could be the craziest, nonsensical thing you've ever heard. And most of the time, they are. Most of the time, they, have, they make zero sense, and they have nothing to do with what's going on around us, but it's because they live in their own little world, and they know what they know, and they don't know all that they don't know. In the same way, we're like that with God. Who can comprehend God's ways? His ways are so much different than ours. He's the author of mathematics. He, he's, he's, he is Mother Nature. There is no, there is no pantheism to you know, all the, the four elements and praying to the wind and the, there's none of that. You know, God is the creator of all those things. That means all of those things are under his command. And if he can write those things that we can't control, when we say, hear my voice, all we are is we're a child begging for a little attention. We just need to be acknowledged and heard sometimes. You know, sometimes they say, just talking about things makes it feel makes you feel better. But sometimes, if somebody's needing to talk about something, it's really good if we stand in and we listen. Even if I don't understand what you're going through, I, I don't really. It's not that I don't care. It's that I can't really uh, relate to what you're going through. I've never been in that situation. I don't know, but I'm still gonna listen to you because I, I care about you. And I say I. I mean, I'm talking. We care about the person whatever the individual is going through. And we know a few of them that will call on us and talk to us. And it's like, I really can't understand what's happening right now with you, but I love you. And I, I'm, here to, I'm here to listen to you. 
That's the way God is with us. That's what David's saying here is hear my voice, O God, in my meditation. That, that might be the second point. And we ain't even got out of the first verse yet. Is in my meditation. We're going we're gonna to hold on to that, put a pin in that. Because what that word means is, it may not be translated that way, but it means prayer. It means a moment of stepping away from everything in life, the hustle, the bustle, the everything. You stop. And it's, that, it's those moments where we're supposed to do what? Be still and know that I'm God. And we bring everything to God in prayer and supplication. And that's what that meditation is. In my moment of silence, when in this previous psalm when David says, in the morning when I wake, I praise you. In the, uh, in the, in the night, in my nighttime watches, you know, um, I pray to you. And that's what, that's what he's talking about here. In my meditation, in the moments that I stop and I step away from life. You ever hear somebody say, uh, you know, hey, just looking at your situation from the outside in, has anybody ever told you to step away from it? Walk away from it for a minute. You're drunk on it. You know, you just need to step away and get an outside perspective of it. There's a lot of times in life we need to just step away from our problem, take a real, take a look, not, not focus on the small problem, the, the immediate problem at hand, but look at the big picture. And how does that problem fit in with the big picture? How vital and important or trivial is it? Is this really a life-altering dilemma that you have or is it something you've blown out of proportion and drawn? And even then, regardless of what it is, we take it to God in our meditation, in our times of being with Him. Third, third thing, and I, there might be five or six really, but the third thing that I, I, I gained from, from this study, from studying this psalm, was still in verse 1 when he says, Preserve my life from fear of the enemy. He doesn't say preserve my life from the enemy. He's not asking to be rescued from the enemy. He's asking to be delivered from the fear of the enemy. How many times do we let our worry of the anticipation of a bad situation or the anticipation of what uh, may come drag us down, weigh us down, and then and it wouldn't, how many times have you gone so far out of proportion that what happened wasn't even close to what you were worried about? Now, why worry so much, right? And, and that, that speaks volumes to what, how we live daily, but how we've been living in the last couple of years. The whole world's afraid of a lot of things, legitimately afraid of a lot of things. Fear is not a bad thing. Fear can be a good thing. If you go over, skip over to uh, verse 9. Start, we'll, we'll start in verse 8. He says, so he will make them stumble over their own tongue. This is, this is God punishing the wicked. All who see them shall flee away, and all men shall fear. Fear is not a bad thing. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of, the, of wisdom, Scripture tells us. Fear can be a good thing. I think I've used this analogy before, or, or uh, this description before, but if someone's walking off the edge of a cliff and you don't yell at them to, to tell them, hey, you're about to fall off a cliff. And they turn to you and say, hey, man, you just scared me to death. I, I just saved your life. The fear that you had of falling off that cliff saved your life. Fear is not a bad thing. Fear of drowning may keep you from swimming with sharks. You know, fear is not, not a terrible, terrible thing. Fear of losing your wife may keep you from adultery. It should be fear of the Lord will keep us from sin, any of those sins. That's, that's what David talks about here when he says uh, in verse, verse 5 through 7 or through 6, he says, they encourage themselves, talking about the wicked, in an evil matter. They talk of laying snares secretly. They say, who will see them? And they devise iniquities. Ooh, we have perfected a shrewd scheme, they will say. And both the inward thought and the heart of man are deep. It's like, it's like they're saying, who's going to see what we're doing? Who's going to punish us for it? They're not going to see the plan that we're laying out and we're really going to trap them and get them. And then what bad can come from us from doing it? I mean, who's watching us? Well, God's watching. 
that's the thing is we never want to displease God. We don't want to disappoint Him. And we definitely don't want to forget that we've been forgiven for the things that we've done. And that the wicked, the wicked, they just don't understand that. They just don't. And someday they will. And at, at that point, it, it'll either be too late or hopefully they'll understand before it's too late. Hopefully we can turn the wicked back from their ways. That's what we saw, we see a lot of at Teen Challenge. Most of the guys there and gals, they, they, will, they will tell you from the bottom of their hearts, I was a liar, I was a thief, I was a terrible parent, I was a terrible son, daughter, I stole from people, I manipulated to get my way, and, and, and they don't blame it on the drugs or the addiction. They, they use that as part of their testimony and part of their story, but they don't say, well, it was because of the, or it was, and, and they don't even blame it on the, they, they, as part of their testimony, they will share some of the hurts and pains that they've gone through, like uh, molestation or uh, uh, abusive home or a broken home or homelessness and all these things. But most of them, the ones that are really, really, really being healed, that have surrendered to Christ, have acknowledged the fact that no, those weren't, those aren't the reasons that I did it. They're the catalysts. They're the things that made me, you know, as bad as I was, but I, I, I did all that. It was me that did that. I, I, I was wrong. I, I acknowledge that. And that's one of the reasons that I, I like going there so much is because it makes me honest. It makes me humble. It makes me remember not to forget where I came from and where I am now it has nothing to do with me. Nothing. And, and all of us can say the same thing if we're new creatures in Christ, that we're, we're just not the same people that we were before we knew him. We're just not. Because we're as guilty as the wicked people here in uh, verse 6, where it says at the end of verse 6, both the inward thought and the heart of a man are deep. He's not talking about deep intellectually. Like some of us might be, most, most of us not, you know. But the inward man, and the heart, they're, they're full of wickedness. And, and the heart, what does what scripture tell us? The heart is exceedingly wicked. And the tongue, if we could control our tongue, we could bridle our tongue, we could control the whole body. We'd have no problem if we had self-control. He's, he's talking about the wicked, but this applies to every single person that's ever lived. We all have a propensity for sin. There are a lot of people, I'm not a psychologist, and I, I have my personal opinion on things, but there, there's a whole school of thought about um, truly believing that people are inherently good and that nature and nurture teaches them to be bad. And then there are other people that are on the complete other side of that and say that people are inherently bad and that nature or nurture teaches them to be good. And I have my opinion on that. And so a lot of people teeter in the middle and say it's a mix of both. And, you know, but you know, scripture tells us that we're born into sin. David said he was, he was born into sin. There's that, that fall from grace that Adam and Eve had that all of us have. We have to have that atoned for. If you were born on a desert island and you never met another human being ever, never, never, was introduced to the thought or theory of God, never read the Bible or anything else, never influenced whatsoever by any religion, and you grew up by yourself, would you go to heaven? You're born with Adam and Eve's sin. It has to be atoned for. There's a whole school of thought on that too. There's a whole, there's a whole um, argument, uh, atheist argument about what about the people, there's a good, there's a good man, a good man living in Africa who's never heard of Jesus, but he's a good man. He's done good things his whole life. He's never done anything bad to anybody, and he dies. What about him? And then the argument for that, and this isn't our argument, I'm pretty sure this is uh, William Lane Craig, I think, uh, apologist, will say that, that, would, that, that would be a problem if there were any good men. There's nobody like that. There's nobody that is just without sin. It's just not possible. Not possible. Jesus is the only one who is without sin. 
And he was that way because he was 100% man and 100% God. He came to show us what Israel was supposed to do but couldn't do. And it may be that Israel couldn't do it. Not that they didn't want to. I'm sure there were many that tried. They just couldn't. Because God is just. And because he's just, that means he's fair. And when that, you know, when that, you know, have you ever heard that saying, you get what you put in and people get what they deserve? Well, we, we don't always get what we put in in this life. But every one of us will get what we deserve in the end. Not that we deserve to be saved. Or we deserve to be punished. That if we are without Jesus, God is just and righteous and faithful. And he has said, if you chose not to follow him, I will honor your decision and send you where you chose to go. That's, that's really the ultimate simplification of atonement and salvation. Is he doesn't want to punish anyone. That's not his desire. His desire is so that everyone will be saved. That's why he sent Jesus, uh, John 3.16. He wants everyone. But in order for us to really truly love him, and we have to choose him. If I was betrothed, or if my wife was betrothed to me, we may learn to be affectionate for one another. It may even grow into love. But how much better is a marriage that starts from a uh, a mutual love or a mutual affection. I, I love my wife more now than I did the day I married her. I do. And I'll love her more next year and the year after that because we, we're growing. Our love, our love grows as we get older. The same with God and with Jesus. The more you know about him, the more you study and the more you're with him, the more you pray, the more you're in this meditation, the more you feel like he hears you and he's actually listening. He's giving you that attention. He's shifting his gaze to you, the author and the creator of everything in the world. He's stopping what he's doing, which is vastly more important than us, and giving us that attention. How he does that to every single person every single day, I do not know, but he knows. And that makes him different. And how do you, you know, my kids, I use them as an example all the time, but that's only because that's the season I'm in and I'm learning so much from them. They light up. They absolutely light up when you give them attention. When when you when they're trying to get you and and there are there are a lot of times I say not now not now honey I'm doing something or I'm, I'm daddy's really busy right now. And we've all we've we've shown them the Daniel Tiger episode. Uh, how's the song go? Uh, when a grown up's too busy to play with you, look around and find something to do. You know, we've shown them that. Like sometimes grown ups are just too busy, but. In those moments where we just stop and we listen, and it seems super important, and you know, I don't know, one of the twins is telling on the other twins because he dropped his waffle and he got honey on the floor, and I'm so sorry, Daddy. You know, oh, it's okay, kiddo. We'll clean it up. Oh, <gasps> you know, that's the way we should feel when we're in meditation with with God when we're praying to Him, and we shouldn't feel anxious because because we have it. We have an enemy. Listen, David's talking about his enemies physical and they were he, he'd heard you know many times that they were plotting against him and they were laying a trap and they were going to try to trip him up and he was constantly battling with that he said she said and this overthrow and overtake and because he was in the the, the kingship you know they, they wanted him but this applies to us too we have an enemy that's like a, a a roaring lion seeking to devour everybody that he can he's laying traps for us he's not fighting his head on He's coming in from the sides and the back. It's an ambush and it's a trip up and um, it's like a it's like a it's like a cancer. It's like every now and again uh, he's taken taken poison and just injected us with a little bit. And it may not get us now, but it's going to take care of us later. Well, God God answers that here, and I circled it because because it really stood out to me. In verse seven, he says, "But God shall shoot at them with." an arrow, not with arrows, or not, you know, any kind of multiplied, it's a singular, and that, that's Jesus. That's what, that's what God did to the enemy, and to all enemies. He shot an arrow. He, he sent the one thing that could stop it all, and take away everybody. So because of that, we are saved, we are delivered from 
and can be delivered from the fear of the enemy. We don't have to fear him. We don't have to fear anybody in this life. We don't have to fear anything, whether it's uh, old age, poverty, death. We shouldn't fear it. David lived a life where he wasn't, well, I mean, you are afraid, but he wasn't in fear. He didn't run. He wasn't anxious. Um, he didn't hide. He didn't build a fort, lock himself in a room, and, and, and you know, have soldiers guard the door so nobody could ever get in and become, uh, whatever you call that, a recluse. He lived. He lived life. And sure, he was afraid, you know, from moment to moment. I mean, if, I was, if I was about to get in a car wreck, I'd be afraid, hit the brakes and turn. But I'm not afraid to die. I don't want to. But I'm not afraid of what's on the other side because I know what the promise tells me. There's an arrow that God has shot at all the enemies, including the devil, and death, and sin. And I don't have to worry about that because I've been atoned for. My sins are forgiven. Not because of who I am or anything that I've done, but because of who Jesus is and what he did. In um, 2 Corinthians, no, I'm sorry, Philippians, Philippians chapter 4, I think we've all read this, verses 6 through 7 say, for all of us, we know, we should, we know this, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your quests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. There's a, there's a man named George Mueller, um, pretty famous. Uh, he, wrote, he wrote an autobiography, and uh, in it he, he chronicles a lot of his prayers. And his, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of like a prayer diary. Um, and there's, there's times in there where he mentions, you know, um, on day 362 of such and such, of praying about such and such situation. And it kind of makes you stop and go, well, you're already better than me at praying because I don't keep track of how many times I've prayed for a, for a single thing. But at the same time, he prayed for this thing over and over and over until he didn't get, not that he was looking for the answer that he was looking for, but until he felt content that it was answered, until it was acknowledged. He prayed for it. We should do that. It tells us to pray without ceasing. That so many times we pray for a little while and then we forget. But if, if my kid, if my child was sick, I wouldn't stop praying until there was a result. Either they got better or they went home to heaven. And then even, even then, regardless of the result, I would still pray. If he went home to heaven, I would be praying for some kind of peace and grief for the grief, you know, to let it pass, but to never let me forget. And if he came home to me, he got better, then I would be praying a thanksgiving. And I would be praying, hopefully, that I would never, ever, ever stop being thankful for that. That I wouldn't take it for granted three or four years down the road, you know? And so knowing that, why don't I pray that way when they're healthy now? They don't even have sickness. Shouldn't I pray every day? Thank you. Thank you for what I have and for another day to live. And that is the kind of way, the kind of, the kind of way we should, should live and practice our prayer life. But it says... In verse 7, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The, the key there and how it relates to Psalm 64, if you're praying about something, don't stop until you have that peace. Until that peace comes over you, that contentment. And I'm not saying pray for a 24-hour period until you get tired enough that you just say, yeah, okay, I feel peace. You pray each day until you feel peace. They say, you know, when someone passes away, I've always heard it said, you know, time, time heals everything. And I'm young, I know that, and I haven't lived a whole lot, a whole lot, you know, whatever, but I have a lot of people, I've lost a lot of people. And time doesn't heal anything. In my, 
in my life, that hasn't been my experience that it heals anything. It makes it easier as you grieve and mourn, but you never forget the person and it never stops hurting. It just hurts differently. It's not that it hurts less. We learn to live with it and we learn to be content and what we do and what we should do is learn from it that that's going to be me too. The pain that I feel when I lost my mom, that's the pain my kids are going to feel the day that I die. So I, I need to I need to remember that and be good to them and be around them and love them so that when they do feel that, it's not, I don't know, it's still going to hurt. There's nothing I can do to take that away. Nothing. But I want it to be a good hurt. I want them to know I'll see them again someday. And I want them to live the rest of their life thinking I better not mess up because he sees me and he would be disappointed because I want to see him again. I love him that much. That's the kind of life we want to live. And in verse, uh, verse 10, David says, The righteous shall be glad in the Lord and trust in him, and all the upright in heart shall glory. This is the encouraging part. Out of all of it, some people in this life, they just seem to be blessed. The wicked, they live so many, there's so many that don't. There's so many wicked people that are lost and need rescuing. They need help. You can see it on the faces of the people who have really surrendered at Teen Challenge and people in prisons and then uh, people like me and, and Ronnie Poe that have had these experiences of encountering Jesus and being pulled from the ditch, or pulled from the gutter, if you want to say it that way. And you can see it on them that they're truly grateful to not be where they were because it was bad and it could have got worse. But there, there are some people, a very small amount, that are living however they want to live and they've got plenty of money and they've got influence and power and they can do whatever they want and they can lay snares and who's going to say anything about it? And a lot of them, you look at them and you say, how in the world that bad a person, curse God right on TV, curse God right, you know, any, say anything you want to, you know, and nothing. How does, he, how does he live like that? And I'm stuck here like this. Well, it's only temporary. And eventually, 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 every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And for us, the righteous and the upright, not self-righteous and not pat ourselves on the back for being so good and, oh, oh, don't you wish you were like me, you know, but to say, when, when Jesus comes, I'm glad to see him come. And I'm not, oh no. That's what I don't want. I don't want to see him and be scared. I, I will be scared like, oh man, wow. You know, but I won't be in fear. I'll be like, oh wow. That's my Lord. That's my Savior. I'm so glad. The, I saw a thing. I saw a thing earlier that I just thought was funny, but at the same time, it was funny because it was, it's true. Uh, said, uh, normal is not coming back. Jesus is. <laughs> and I thought, that's right. That is right. Normal's not coming back. What's normal? Nothing's been normal. It's society changes. Does, was 1990 the same as 1960? It wasn't. Things change. Society changes. Culture changes. Normal won't come back. We, can, we, we don't need to be waiting on that. Jesus is. Let's wait on him. And, and know that he is coming back. And we can... We can go to him in prayer and, and we can be there for him and he can be there for us. And as long as we're living, we live for him. And that's how we're supposed to live in prayer like David tells us to. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of what this world's going to do to us. If they're going to close our church doors. Um, if they're going to tax us higher. If they're going to tell us what we have to preach or not preach. or Don't worry about that. God will take care of it. And it's not something the church has never been through before. We don't need to be afraid. We don't need to be, I mean, be prepared for anything, I guess. But above all else, be prepared for when Jesus returns. Be prepared for when your name is called. And when you, you know, what's that song? I'll fly away, you know. Be prepared for that. And, and share that with other people. Because most, most of those wicked people, they're wicked because they're afraid. Most of them, they won't acknowledge that. But what's the problem with the bully in school? 
He's afraid. He's a bully, probably because he's being bullied at home. He's doing what he's learning, you know, or most of the time it's, it's self-doubt and it manifests and, and outward rage and, you know, whatever. Most people want to hurt you before you can hurt them. That's their safeguard. And you mess them up when you love on them. You mess them up when they come to rob you and you give them everything you got. Take it. Hey, I can take my car keys too. Take it. You need more than I do. Say, what? You know, are you crazy? Yeah. Crazy about Jesus. Oh, no. But it'll be different, you see. It'll be different. So let's be different. If you would, go with me to the Lord pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that we've had tonight together and the, the studying and sharing of your word. We pray for uh, strength and courage that your Holy Spirit give us peace like, like you tell us that, uh, that when we pray with supplication and thanksgiving that you'll give us a peace that surpasses all understanding through Christ Jesus. And we pray for that, that we don't, we're not afraid. We're not fearful of this world or anything that it can do from us because we have a hope in you that can't be shaken and, and can't be taken away. There's, there's nothing in this world that can take us from your hands if we belong to you, and, and we do. We pray that you continue to bless us and that you let us do your work and serve you the way that you want us to. That you give each of us a purpose and that we fulfill that purpose, that we live this life the way that you, the way that you wanted us to. And that all of us know that we have a voice and that you hear us. You're there for us when we pray, when we ask, when we seek. You're, you're never going to forsake us, and we, we thank you for that. I pray that each one of us uh, gets home safe and uh, comes back at the next appointed time and helps disciple outside these walls. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.